This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. It's a pleasure to have back with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, well-known and prolific writer on the web, who is the publisher of the website uh, of twominds.com. Uh, good morning, Charles. Morning, Gordon. Glad to be here again. Well, with uh, between record snowfalls and the, and the Pats winning the Super Bowl, it's uh, it's been pretty exciting around here in Boston. But do I assume you were rooting for the Seahawks by chance? <laughs> Uh, you know, I didn't really have a, a, a dog in this hunt. Um, I mean, it, it, it was exciting to see such two, um, two equally matched teams play. That's what I enjoyed. It's because so many Super Bowls have been blowouts. So it was, uh, you couldn't ask for a better game. Boy, I tell you, everybody in New England was on the verge of a heart attack. You don't want it any closer than that. They, you're right. It, it was one play, right? Anyway, Anyway, our listeners aren't here to listen to us talk talk football but Charles I, I need to mention to our listeners before we begin because uh, we have so many new listeners this is intended as a, as a discussion uh, which we have monthly uh, which we just happen to tape it's not an interview and so we you know we typically pick a subject on both desks uh, that um, and then try and make sense of it together and we share it with our listeners as a as a public surface. Hopefully, others find it of, of some value. Certainly, we both feel it is, and uh, at least a value to our, to ourselves. And because some people uh, we just wonder about the the, uh, the the format on it. Any comment on that, Charles? From your standpoint? Um, well, Gordon, I think we've um, we do have a conversation that basically stretches back three years I think we've been doing this quite a while so um, I hope that everybody feels our comfort level in challenging the other guy or asking the other guy for some um, further comments you know so that's how we that's how we play it okay open uh, in we're, we're gonna t t we agree today we're gonna talk about uh, we call it uh, we're searching for word is the next peg to fall but really we're talking about the currency events and, and what they mean to China. And obviously, you and I have come to a conclusion that the Chinese currency um, is, is in a precarious position right now. Uh, not it's, it's a very loose peg, but nevertheless a peg, because you know what we've had is the sequence of events are accelerating. We had the, the Russian ruble in December collapse, and we all we talked about that. Then we had the, the the shocker with the Swiss franc coming off their peg in January. As we're talking right now, the Danish krona is is and peg it's in trouble, and they're gone to negative nominal rates. They're negative mortgage rates. <laughs> You're getting paid to take out a mortgage. Can't make sense out of that one. The Singapore dollar's got some issues. The Hong Kong dollar also, but it's it's tied to the the Chinese. Uh, so I don't see anything happening, but you can see the pressures there. So the question is, what's going to happen with the uh, the yuan? Now, may maybe, Charles, we could begin with just defining what is what is a currency peg for those that may not be familiar with it. Right. Um, and, uh, Gordon, you have a nice slide here that explains it. Um, a currency peg is when one nation seeks the stability of another nation's currency by setting a peg to it and say in, in the late 90s uh, Thailand had a peg they, they had 25 units of their currency the bought to the dollar and um, the Chinese peg has been somewhere between six and eight over the last uh, say decade and so the idea behind a peg is let's make it really stable for all importers and exporters so there'll be far less volatility and uncertainty about what what the um, the actual value of imports and exports are in my home currency. If there's a peg, a lot of uncertainty goes away. And so that's what a country buys, if you will, when it sets a peg to the dollar or the euro. But the problem is the peg is arbitrary. And so it doesn't necessarily reflect the dynamics of the two economies. And so when you look at a situation 
like um, Argentina, when they had a peg, it, it, it seemed to work terrific for a while. But then the, the underlying fundamental differences between the two economies that, uh, on either side of the peg, um, it, it ends up uh, breaking. And then you unleash all the instability that was hidden by the peg. That's how I would describe it. H how would you describe um, the benefits or, or, um, and, and dangers of a peg? Well, the, the benefits is it gives you uh, stability, obviously, but typically you're pegging it in some way where you can get a competitive advantage <laughs> um, uh, subtly in it, but at the, at the level you strike the peg at and, and, and drive to it. But, but it creates stability because then everybody knows what it is and, and work, works around it. But, you know, with right now with, with, uh, with China, uh, in this bandwidth, they hold it within a bandwidth on their on their peg, so they, it moves between up and down within it. But it's very it's been pounding at the upper bandwidth, which means them trying to weaken um, the um, the currency. And it's because the it's fundamentally Charles right now the the U.S. dollar strengthening to the degree that it has, and the and the yen, the Japanese yen plummeting to the degree that it has. You got the you got the Chinese sitting here with their dollar their band is is against the United States dollar so you, therefore they're taking it right in the ear, but it's 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 the Japanese right across the channel there, with, with and this chart shows that I have up now just how dramatic it's been against against the um, against the yen, and and remember when you're a manufacturer and specifically in China you have razor thin margins. And when you get this movement in cur currency, not only do you lose competitive advantage, you lose margins. And the borrowing rates for corporations in, in, in China are extremely high. So th that's a big nut that they have to make. So what it's basically doing, it's, it's bankrupting the companies broad-based or minimally. It's forcing them to cut back on, on employment. And China, China's managed differently than most, most countries around the world. It doesn't manage it for growth. I mean, it, it has phenomenal growth. It manages it for employment. It's a social issue. It's a social stability issue. And in China right now, the goal is 10 million new jobs a year. Charles, 10 million net new jobs a year with manufacturing productivity, stripping jobs re regularly just to be competitive with automation. And now you have this problem. This is, so what do you do about it? What, what, what are the options? Right. And, um, Gordon, before the show, um, we were speaking about um, one key issue here is the relative size of the Chinese economy compared to these other currencies that have, have um, devalued and destabilized. Those have been relatively small parts of the global economy. But if um, whatever China does, that is like the second largest or one of the two largest economies in the world, and so there's going to have a vast global impact. Now, I, I think we should... Um, Critic, take, is cri absolutely critically. It's, the, these are these dominoes that have been falling are very small, but right. they'll, they'll take down a big domino, and a big domino is, is, is the one, the renminbi. And if they do, the deflation will accelerate. They will be exporting deflation in a massive way. And this is a shock the central banks can't, can't absorb because they're already, their, their bank ratios are around 50 to 1 leverage on the central banks right now, or capital ratios, which means they're almost insolvent, but they can't be because they can print effectively issue unlimited amounts of money. But at some point, you're going to end up with serious currency crises. Yeah, let's talk about inflation and deflation in, in, in practical terms. And, and so what... Um, let's say that something is made in China that costs a hundred dollars um, when when translated, you know, from yuan into dollars. Now the dollar's risen seventeen percent since last June, um, approximately, and against the the, the Japanese yen, it's it's risen thirty percent, right? So what does that mean for China? Well, that means everything coming out of China and and being sent to Europe now is 17% more expensive because the dollar is strengthened 17% against the euro and uh, and that's dragged the yuan exactly in the same in the same direction and so china's facing um, these huge um, you know sort of increases in their 
their products priced in these other currencies. So, um, and that's where I just wanted to reemphasize your point, which is how can you make money when the price tag on all your stuff it just went up 20 to 30 percent everywhere you're selling except the U.S. <laughs> and, and your margins are so razor thin. Yes. These are not high value products. These are basic commodities and that's been the, the basis of which they're, they've built their whole export engine. They want to move up to higher value add, but they're not there. That may right. be, Japan may be, be there and they're having problems. So, you know, a couple percentage moves uh, on currency and there's your margin gone. You know, right. it's, it's like the iPod, the, you know, the, what the Chinese get out of it when it's manufactured is next to nothing. It's, it's really the distribution and others that, 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 that make the profits, but in the currency, they lose it all. So, you know, and, you know, and, and what's going on with, with China right now, Charles, is they, they're learning that you, basically that you can't deflate a credit bubble safely because China's sweating out, you know, a hangover of about $26 trillion in credit boom. Now think of it as just over capacity, whether it was infrastructure or manufacturing, all built on demand. And if that demand is slowing, which which it is, and we quantitative easing has brought demand forward, which it has, on the other side of that is a big hole. So that hole is what Japan is seeing in terms of demand, but they got such excess capacity. So even without the currency issues, they've got to squeeze on the, on a capacity problem, so uh, how do the how do they get through that and still grow ten million more new jobs? The clock is ticking, and they they they're they're sweating how they're going to do that. Or within twelve months, they're going to have massive social unrest. People forget, Charles, that during the two thousand and eight crisis, and we had a layoffs and everybody was worrying here. They had twenty eight million people that were suddenly laid off there within about. 35, 40 days. I can remember them worried about people coming home from the Christmas holiday or the, the New Year holiday, and they had armed guards at all of the train stations. They were concerned about civil unrest because the jobs may not be there or weren't going to be there for them. Right. So, so they, they know the, the magnitude of this. And, you know, we got, they got something like, or at least had, 50 million people leaving the rice paddies or the rural areas going to the cities expecting jobs. So this this uh, this this credit uh, problem, uh, you know, their their debt has risen from like about a hundred percent to two hundred and fifty percent of GDP in eight years. And GDP in Europe or in China is people don't really appreciate Charles fully that it's not about their exports and their imports. They have massive exports, which says their GDP should be high, but they have massive imports. And, and, and so they subtract. The real contributor to the GDP in China has been real capital investment, the I in the GDP. And that is just, you know, in the 40% plus and has been plummeting. And with a bad currency or a, uh, a strength, strong currency, that capital is slowed. Right now, the capital inflows into China, I won't say have stopped, but have reversed. And the money's going out. Another complications. A serious, a real, probably the most serious that people don't understand. It's this lack of capital coming in. Yes, and and Gordon, let's talk about um, capital flows because that's what you're what you're talking about, and we can talk about Triffin's paradox. But we can Precisely. start with, we can start with the fact that um, we've talked about this before in previous shows. China's economy is is unlike all the other major trading nations in that its its domestic consumption is about 36 percent of, of its economy compared to 70 percent in the U.S. and and 60 percent in, in other developed countries. And so it's uh, I, I mention that because as you said, 40 percent of their economy is is this investment, not consumption. And so and they everyone. Um, sort of superficially says, oh, well, China can just grow its way out by, by shifting to consumption. But what they don't understand is, as you said, they've already uh, created a credit bubble to support the consumption they've already made. <laughs> they, there's no more credit. You know, what are you going to do? Go from 250% to 500%? Uh, in other words, they've already um, reached the limits on, on, on their credit growth. And so they have... Uh, they have multiple problems here and what we're trying to um, bring to the table is the understanding that that 
the currency is enough to break the Chinese economy in and of itself. Never mind anything else. The currency is critical because they are such an export dependent nation. So let's talk about credit flows because I just read something recently that said um, inflows have have have, tri have uh, declined to a trickle and outflows are in the in the trillions as wealthy Chinese are exiting. Exactly. And so and, and company and and companies pulling capital out too, right. or, or cash uh, cash out. But it, it's not just that it's reversing; it's the fact it's not coming in. Okay. That right. That, that which it is, it is now, and it is as you said, reversing. Well, let's talk real quickly about why the dollar is strengthening in a long-term way. And now, both you and I have had that um, made that call for years. And we're sort of lonely voices out there because everybody looks at the Fed printing money and all the structural problems in the U.S. economy, and they figure, well, the dollar should should crash to zero, right? Well, that may happen at some point, but in the the world as it stands right now, the dollar is going to strengthen for some considerable time. The dollar, and, will, Charles, the dollar, in my opinion, will be the last to fall. Though it's the it's the problem. Right. Right. But it, it will be the last to fall. Well said. And, and, and um, when we're talking about capital flows, we have to think of currencies as commodities. In other words, like if you create um, a huge uh, supply of, of, a, of a currency and you shove it out there in the world, well, it's going to devalue just because the supply is going to overwhelm the demand. And just like if you're selling bushels of wheat and everybody's got a, uh, you know, too much wheat already, the price of wheat's going to collapse. Whereas if, you're stuck, if you issue... Um, less currency then there's demand for that currency then the value of that currency is going to shoot up and that's what's happening with the US dollar and that's Triffin's paradox as the US Federal Reserve uh, trimmed its uh, money printing you know quantitative easing for domestic reasons well now that has um, slammed this the, the sort of money spigot shut globally and I think um, wouldn't you characterize that as one of the key um, dynamics of of this destabilization that without, the Fed's closed the money spigot without question and I've been working with with Richard Duncan and we've been talking about flows here for a year and a half and it, and we have uh, flows right now that we believe is going to force the, the Fed into quantitative easing four sometime before the spring now they will not click quantitative easing four it'll be a program that will disguise it but all you all you need to do is the feds balance sheet will be increased and it's not a u.s problem it's a global problem it's a global shortage of u.s dollar problem um that, that's 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 going on here and the simplest way to think about charles as you were talking about is that with cheap money in america nine trillion dollars was borrowed in america and went offshore and it went to fund all the emerging markets it went it went into into China etc and and when it's the secret of that's called the carry trade and the secret of a carry trade is to borrow the money a cheap rate which America was as close to I guess zero is about as close to cheap as you can get or 0.25 put and and then but you want to borrow it in a currency that's going to go down so when you pay it back you don't pay as much back and you put it into a country that's got good interest rates and hopefully the currency is going to go up that's a benefit, but it's got good rates, and all these China's rates, your emerging market rates were really good. So nine trillion dollars went out, about six trillion, according to the Financial Times, it went into emerging markets. Well, all of a sudden, with the dollar going up, you're on the wrong side of it. And for those of our listeners who are familiar with a margin call, that's an ugly moment, <laughs> and you've got to cover and you've got to hedge, and everybody's scrambling. The dollar gets stronger. And the worse it gets, it fe it feeds on itself, and that's what's going on. So the question is, how do you stop it? We well, can't stop it if their economies are slowing because demand is slowing, because they got more pressures on them, and all the things we just talked about in China. So the dollar only gets stronger. Now, I have the personally seeing there's going to be you know a consolidation correction in the near term, uh, within it, but it it in my opinion it will continue to grow go up, um, and which back to China. They're, they're in a box. They have no choice. They're going to have to remove, my opinion, remove themselves from the peg quickly. Or they won't, um, I'll speculate, Charles, I don't think they will ever say they're removing the peg. What they'll do is increase the band. <laughs> but they're always banging their head at the new band, okay? And and it'll be a way of politically trying to trying to hold it. Or, or the United States 
will be forced into negative rates, negative nominal rates, or or uh, negative uh, removing the financing of the of the excess reserves at the uh, the central bank right now, the two and a half trillion dollars. But I, we could see the same as EU negative rates to force it force these flows out. Um, coming to, to, to and effectively to bring down the U.S. dollar. There's a combination in there because the United States, the Fed has got to know the box that China's in right now. Right, and um, as as you said, the carry trade that um, that people uh, made a lot of money on was borrowing dollars and investing them in China, and, and and a lot of it went into the shadow banking system. I know you've talked about that with Richard as well. Uh, and and at seven, eight, nine, ten percent interest. So that was a wonderful trade. Now it's reversed, and you've got to you've got to acquire dollars to pay off all your debts. And then that um, that demand, I think, um, what we're saying is that demand is only going to grow because the pressure builds on every carry trade that involves the dollar. The higher it goes, the the um, the, the greater the margin call and um, the greater the demand for dollars. Meanwhile, another factor is um, U.S. Um, oil production, you know, energy production has uh, lowered the amount of, um, of, of imports the U.S. is, is um, paying for with dollars, right? So uh, that um, the, and, and the decline in the price of oil has, has those factors have caused um, the U.S. trade deficit, especially in energy, to drop dramatically. And what that means is there's fewer dollars being issued into the global economy for people to acquire and use to pay off debt. So you've got all these sort of constrictions on the supply of dollars while the demand is skyrocketing, and that's what's feeding the self-reinforcing um, feedback loop you, you just described. And so um, we can talk about deflation, maybe. The people talk about exporting deflation. I mean, can you elucidate that a little bit? Um, like China devalues its currency. All of its manufacturing um, products get cheaper. And then those flow to other economies at a lower price tag. That's exporting in, in deflation, correct? Yeah, exactly. And uh, which is great news for us as a consumer. This, yeah, this, that's right. So, but this isn't good if you're a debtor or highly leveraged, because you you need inflation to, in fact, uh, get out from under your debt or to pay it back at less value. So you've made money and you're paying it back at less translation. And so um, we should all want. There's good deflation and bad deflation, and uh, the, uh, we the the. The middle class is so gutted in America right now. We actually need a high level of deflation. Look at what happened with the gas pump. You think everybody isn't excited about that? But unfortunately, what comes with that is the debt infrastructure will collapse because the collateral value that's underpinning it becomes worth less because it's a net present value going forward. So when it starts to fall, you get margin calls. And there's not enough. We Right now, we don't have enough collateral, good collateral that's unpledged to create more debt, to create more credit. And we're, you know, money only comes into existence in the federal banking system by being, it's only lent or borrowed into existence. It's not, we don't say it's, crea it's cr printed. It's got to be borrowed. So unless somebody's pledging, it doesn't, and we need to keep building the money supply. And that, I think, is a... Uh can be uh, attributed to all central banks. They all oh, yes. face the same thing. And so let's talk quickly about China, um, the uncertainty um, that's being created as the peg starts um, eroding or, or changing. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of speculation um, that China should have the new, the next reserve currency. You know, it should completely unpeg from the dollar and, um, and, and, and all of that. But I think what's missing in that discussion is the um, the impact in terms of the instability and uncertainty that's being introduced as China's peg to the dollar erodes or per perhaps eventually dissolves. What's the real value of the renminbi? I don't think anybody knows, and the Chinese don't know either. They've run a 35-year experiment of pegging their currency to the dollar with the idea that they'll you know, exited at some point when everything's safe and stable, but that point um, may never come. There's been a total, effectively, a total lack of price discovery, 
and certainly the mispricing of risk because the currency itself has been manipulated. There's no question about it. Our Congress has been screaming about it for, for endlessly. Um, but all of the whole export-led Asian strategies have been about debasing your currency. Uh, bring down your currency, give yourself a competitive export advantage, take the capital that you get from it, uh, and immediately buy, put, print money in your own country, because now you've got it in the reserves, um, so, so that you can hold your currency down. But at the same time, take that capital and buy the bonds of the America or wherever, the, but let's say pick on the Fed the, or the U.S. Treasury, rather. And what that does is, therefore, the bond prices go up and the interest rates go down, which means the consumer or in a consumption economy can buy more goods. And that's a beautiful, virtuous cycle. And that's what we've been on until it finally reaches the point where the consumption's not coming and the demand is not coming and the middle class can't spend and then it and winds very, very rapidly. And that's effectively what we have going here, Charles. I've got up a chart right now that says, you know, I have the central banks lost control. And, and this is looking at yields, money. And, then, and so yields have been getting less and less as we go towards 0% for 10-year bonds. I mean, this morning, the German bond was trading at point three on a 10 year. It was less than the Japanese on a 10 year, which, which was that, what that says is money's free or it's cheap and it's going, it's going on, could go to the negative. But when it's the rate at which it's dropping here, um, says that printing more money's not solving the problem. And, and, and so they're, they're losing control. And the, the point I tried trying to make is that the levers that they have used to fight the battles, I don't believe are working or they're very sluggish, or they're barely working. And they don't have any other levers right now. There's no other policy or approach than just pump more money at the problem. But it's not happening because it's people can't incur the debt or the credit without more collateral. So that's why a lot are talking about helicopter drops time, uh, uh, with this, Charles. And that is not even bypass, just bypass the banks and actually deliver the money to targeted groups that can spend it. I'm not saying I support that, but that's where it's going. At. That's the that's why we're seeing uh, Obama in the United States saying, oh, free two-year community college. It's, it's the camel's nose under the tent to get to the point where it's going to be forgiveness of college loans um, or subs huge amounts of government, gr not grants, risk-free, to print the money. Quantitative easing for maybe a giant re-education program I'm speculating here but it's coming because that's to get the money directly down to those who are who are spending it Maybe you know um, a lot, I, I did an interview with Steve Keen at London he's a professor there and and he he laid it out chapter and verse and and the in, inner circles that's what they're talking about and that's the whole idea behind negative interest negative interest rates that were NERP from first to SERP that we're going to to penalize savers so that you're, you, it costs you money to keep the money in the bank. You can't. You'll have to get it out to, to keep stimulating this cash. Right. And so, um, Gordon, what, what I think the, the follow-on to that point you just described of the, of the core dynamic of debt and consumption is that um, Triffin's Paradox is basically saying the, the policy decisions you make to keep your domestic economy going have international, you know, global ramifications, Absolutely. which are different from what you anticipated. And so, another way of saying that is the the foreign exchange markets are so large they cannot be manipulated in the same fashion as interest rates. In other words, the Bank of of Japan, the Bank of China, um, the Federal Reserve, all these central banks can manipulate the interest rates in their domestic economies by printing money and buying bonds and, and, and that kind of thing. But the foreign exchange market trades roughly the entire Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet of four and a half trillion dollars every day or two. It's, it's, it's beyond... They can't... Con exactly, exactly right. It's too big to control. The, U right. the global equity market is 60 trillion. The global debt market and bonds is about 100 trillion. And the currency market trades 6 trillion a day. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So what we're seeing is, you know, if someone asks us, well, why do you think the central banks are losing control? They, I think, have already effectively totally lost control of the foreign exchange consequences of their policy decisions. And they're not going to be able to put that um, rabbit back in the hat. 
it's too large and the imbalances are too great. So what we're seeing in the foreign exchange and, and um, markets is, is the consequences of these policy decisions playing out on a stage that the central banks don't control. Well, they, with one caveat, Charles, that they're attempting to control it in ways that are not obvious to everybody, and that is in the global swaps market. The global swaps market is now at clo in the area of $700 trillion, and most of that is interest and currency swaps, exactly what we're talking about here. And, and, and nobody knows who owns those swaps other than a, the large international banks. There's a Bank of International Settlements is the only one that even tells you with the size of it. But it is up uh, over a hundred trillion dollars in, in, in relative last couple of years. Um, and it's growing at a phenomenal rate. Why? That's, that's part of the trying to create the stability. And the, and the shadow banking system, again, it's impossible to get information other than uh, the financial stability group at the Bank of International Settlement is 72 trillion, which is a, the same as or slightly larger than the total global um, economy of GDP. Uh, it begs a lot of questions, but that's that's effectively how they're trying to hold it together. But even that's running out of run. My 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 opinion. It, is something going to happen imminently, Charles? No, I don't believe that. Don't ever underestimate what politicians and central bankers will do. They have got lots of more tricks that they're going to pull out of the out of the hat. But what we do know is volatility is going to increase. Shocks to the system, surprises as things break, are going to get to be more and more common. Political infighting and wrangling between countries is going to get more aggressive because they're fighting for their political life. And, and that's going to be the new investment climate through at least 2015, 2016. If something doesn't break seriously, and that's, that's, that's the game we're at, it could break and it could be, you know, lights off all of a sudden very quickly. But I don't think that's the case. Well, closing comments, uh, Charles, would you like to make? Uh, no, Gordon, I think you did a, uh, just uh, gave an excellent summary. And um, I think my last point would be that um, these policymakers in the Fed and, the, you know, the Eurozone, Bank of Japan, China, I think we have to understand that they're playing a game that no one else has played ever before. There is really no historical precedent. And so that's a big part of the volatility and uncertainty. You know, if they make a mistake and things start breaking, um, it would be um, to be expected because they're only human. And then and, and, uh, they've ramped the situation up to a point that's unprecedented in, in um, human history in terms of credit bubbles, swaps, and uh, the complexities of the, of the international you know, financial system. I wrote a paper here a few weeks back called The Kondratiev Cycle in a Fiat Currency System. And it's my, my opinion that we're in the winter end of deflation, and which is when you get bankruptcies, debt, uh, consolidation, jubilee, or not jubilees, but the removal of the debt because it just has uh, non-performing loans and bad debts that have to be written off and you can't roll it over. And all of these games have really been about deferring that and pushing that out. But it, 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 it's too big a wave because the capitalist system requires that cleansing, this repricing of risk, this re getting back to true value and getting rid of the malinvestment before you can grow together. So all you can do is keep stalling it until you have this cleansing mechanism. Um, it, it's, part, it's inherent in the business cycle. And so we've just got, it, it's, it's inevitable. And the problem is the more you do, the worse, the worse it's going to be at the end. And um, we need to get on with it. Or, or just acknowledge that we're no longer in a capitalist system anymore. We're simply in a credit-driven only system, and it's and we're in a, in a game of central planning, um, and that's the game. It's just all centrally planned from now on. And I don't. We proved. We found that never works, does it? No, exactly. And neither does beggar thy neighbor. So, well, all right. That's what we got. <laughs> anyway, to, I have no idea what we'll be talking about next month again, but it's always a lot of fun. And uh, we'll talk to you next month. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks again. Bye, Charles. Okay. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, 
iTunes and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>